Losers let it happen. Winners make it happen. Dennis Waitley is the winner's winner. A master at understanding self-development and high performance. He has studied and counseled winners in every walk of life, from top Fortune 500 company executives to Super Bowl champions. Self-esteem is the deep down inside the skin feeling of your own worth. An outstanding public speaker and noted author, Dennis Waitley is a productivity consultant to government agencies and youth organizations. And he's one of our most respected experts on the psychology of winning. You know, I view life as a very real game in which there are no timeouts, no substitutions, and the clock is always running. I used to think it was a scrimmage or a drill that I'd get to instant replay my life, and I found out that every day is the Super Bowl, every day is the Olympics, every day is the World Series, every day is the Grand Final. Life is a real game. And the winners in life, well, they're like you. They never whine. They come in fourth exhausted but exhilarated because they came in fifth last time. Winners treat animals like people and people like brothers and sisters. Losers criticize everyone and bring them down to their miserable level because misery loves company. A loser is a person in this abundant country that would like to look like, earn like, and take time off like somebody else, but doesn't work to try to become that just wishes about it. A spectator in life wouldn't be here tonight and wouldn't be watching this. They're too busy escaping from the goals they never set and from the roles they can't imagine themselves to be in. But people like you, who seem to get what they want by giving other people what they need in a very natural, free-flowing way. I've been studying them like Jiminy Cricket. The reason I have is I'm hoping they'll rub off on me. I've always wanted to be a winner in my life and I'll tell you, they have an uncommon way of thinking, a common denominator. I used to think winning was in the talent, but the world's full of talented losers. I used to think winning was in the education, so I lined my den with diplomas, unable to relate to people. Winning is on the street. School is never out for the professional. You keep on learning. I thought winning was in the way you looked, but I found out that people that didn't look too good ended up being great. I thought it was a gifted birth, but I found out so many people had a lot going in, they took nothing out. Some people had nothing going in, they took everything out. I found out that winning was all in the attitude. It's all in how you look at it. Your attitude is either the lock on or key to your door of success. Either locks you out or opens it up for you. And I'd like to give you the attitudes and action steps that make a real winner in life. I mean the kind of winner that helps other winners, too. If you win, I win. Only if you win do I win. And that's the real winner in life, the ones that build other winners, too. I'd like to give you those high-performance ideas that are common in people who become so uncommonly successful. And there are five winning attitudes I'd like to share with you tonight and today and the rest of your life. One idea worth taking home. What if they were five Olympic rings and we were all Olympians, which we are? And what if you could transmit them to everyone you meet? Everyone you meet. The first winning attitude that I found is positive self-awareness. What good does it do to be motivated to a dream if you don't see it for you, if you don't see your own potential? We've been selling ourselves short since we were children. You see, we associated ourselves with our mistakes. When my kids were good, it was natural. I just didn't say anything. But when they were bad, I was the first one to criticize them, to point out their mistakes, and they began to associate themselves with their mistakes instead of their successes. And they reinforced maybe what was wrong with them. They labeled themselves. I, I was labeled when I was young, I, I got to admit, Dumbo ears, beaver teeth, buzzard beak, motor mouth, metal mouth, and turtle breath. <laughs> And they said the turtle died, too, in your case. <laughs> and I've never gotten over those early labels, and my awareness as a result has been limited. 
You never outgrow the limits you set. You only set new ones within which you must live. And habits start like off-handed notions, flimsy cobwebs at first, then with practice, like unbreakable cables to strengthen or shackle a life. The limits of the human are self-imposed. I've been to the UCLA Brain Institute, and I can tell you for sure, the human mind in the ability to create a new place to grow, to imagine, to remember, to make things that never existed before, to lead a new life, to get out of the ghetto to greatness, is unlimited, only limited by our own vision of ourselves. But somewhere along the way, we put the lid on ourselves and self-limited. I've decided to blow the lid off finally and get some positive self-awareness. I ask myself the question, if it weren't for time and money and circumstance, what would I be? Are you kidding? I'd be terrific, but I don't have the time. <laughs> I was a veteran and I uh, served in the war, and I went to school a lot, and my dad was a warehouseman. If it weren't for the money, I th oh, if I had the money. We were born poor like you were, and uh, first thing you know, uh, I never saw any money for us. I went into education to seal my fate, make sure I never earned any of that stuff, but I couldn't see it for me. If it weren't for my circumstance, are you kidding? I'm a Gemini. My dad was a warehouseman. I was the middle child, caught in the sandwich. I know a guy that didn't make it because he was the only child, no feedback. <laughs> I know somebody that didn't make it because they were the youngest child, only got hand-me-down secondhand. I know somebody didn't make it because they were the oldest child, had to take care of all the little kids in the family. And we talked to each other and we found out there was time and money and circumstance. If I had the time, Ray Kroc, 54, selling paper cups, golden arches, McDonald's at age 54, the beginning. Grandma Moses, 75, painted her first painting at 75 years old. Went on to paint five to 700 masterpieces after age 75. I've always liked George Burns. I can't die, I'm booked. <laughs> if it weren't, if I had the time, we've got the time. If it weren't for the money, if I had the money. Remember, remember old Walt? <laughs> I'll tell you, what a loser he was. Walt Disney, are you kidding? He was bankrupt for the second time. Can you imagine going in? What guts it takes. Had a hand puppet named Steamboat Willie. He talked in a falsetto voice. He was the first voice of Mickey Mouse. Hey, I got a deal for you. I want to give you a cartoon during uh, silent movies. Get out of here, Walt. Another one of them crazy ideas. He believed in his dream when he only had a dream to hang on to. He was as successful when he was broke with a hand puppet as he was when Disneyland and Disney World opened. It's just that money flows to great ideas and to persistence. And you and I will get the money because it flows to us if we work. If it weren't for my circumstance, I think of a woman in history, middle-aged, Midwest, garment district of the United States, went down with her husband to the kibbutz, and they had marital problems and were divorced and bun on the back, roll down hose. Not so beautiful on the outside, but oh, how brilliant and beautiful on the inside was Golda Meir, one of the great woman prime ministers of the world. Grandma with a bun and roll down hose, if it weren't for my circumstance. You and I have that, and that's what positive self awareness is all about not seeing the limits and understanding that we are self-limiting. Now that you understand just how critical self-awareness is to the psychology of winning, what can you do in your daily life to become more aware of yourself and of your potential? Let me suggest some action steps you can take right now that will help put you on the road to positive self-awareness. Begin by seeing yourself through others' eyes. Ask yourself these questions. How would I like to be married to me? How would I like a partner like me? Would I like a parent like me? Or a manager like me? Or a child like me? Or even an employee like me? Secondly, evaluate important information. When you read or hear something that impresses you, check out the validity of the statements. Find out how accurate they really are. And in doing so, 
get input from experts who really know the score. Next, break your daily routine. Try going to work another way. Cut down on television watching and increase your reading. Make new friends with different interests or start a new hobby or even a community service project. Finally, take a personal health inventory. At least once a year, have a comprehensive physical exam. Review the lifestyles of your parents and grandparents and try to break any similar patterns in your life that could harm your health. Instead of buying junk food, try eating fruits and vegetables and begin a regular exercise program that you can enjoy and that you'll continue. What's holding us back in life? I'll tell you, for me, it's been my self-esteem. And that's the second winning attitude. If I could give the children of the world a box for Christmas for every day, I'd give them a giant box of self-esteem. And they'd open it up and see that it doesn't make any difference what you wear, who you are, what you've done, what you own, what you drive. It's how you feel about what you're doing at any given moment in time. Self-esteem is the deep down inside the skin feeling of your own worth. And that's why, as the second winning attitude, it is the single most important quality, in my opinion. It's the internalization of value. Doesn't make any difference what you're doing. Doesn't make any difference what you did last week. Doesn't make any difference what you're going to do tomorrow, but it, it makes a difference of how you feel about your potential. It's that feeling. You know, I give programs for young people in the summertime, and they come to youth camps, and I've been trying to help young people understand that it's not designer jeans for tots, and it's not uh, what you're driving or what you're wearing, it's how you're feeling. That's why peer pressure is so strong. You want to belong to a winning team. There'll never be a human being more important than another based upon what you got or how you look or what you do. It's how you feel about yourself. And that's the most important thing, the internalization of value, internal standard. Not comparing yourself down or up with anyone, using competition to keep you honest, keep the quality in and the price right, and setting internal standards and giving your wins away. The three greatest fears that I've come in contact with in my life are the fear of rejection, which is the greatest fear that anyone ever has. It's greater than the fear of anything. The fear of being made a fool of in front of your peer group. Why do you suppose the pressure is on young people to dress, act, and look a certain way? It goes right up into adulthood. We're all the same. We're afraid to have people laugh at us. That's why in kindergarten, they raise their hands. They don't care if they're wrong or right. They just want to answer anything. By the time you get to the fourth grade, you begin to worry about people snickering at you and being wrong. By the time you're in high school, you say, I ain't answering. <laughs> and when you're a grown-up, you always play it safe with the same kind of friends who have the same beliefs. And that's the way it is. The fear of rejection becomes the fear of change. I don't want to change and set an example. I might get criticized. I might get ridiculed. And it becomes the fear of success. And through all of my life, the one thing I've been afraid of most is making it, <laughs> of winning. You know why? Because where we grew up and how we were and how it was, it didn't seem right for us. And so I had permanent potential. I just kind of majored in minors and did things that were tension relieving instead of goal achieving. And I made a lot of excuses, uh, the fear of rejection. I, there was always a reason. And success always stood in my way. They asked me to publish a book, so I procrastinated. See, procrastination is caused by the fear of success. You know if you did it, you'd win, and you'd be better. So I didn't do it so I could be my comfortable self. And it worked out right. I painted the fence and walked the dog. Next thing I knew, the opportunity passed. It felt so good whew, just to be me again. You and I aren't afraid to be rejected because we've learned one thing about self-esteem. Since self-esteem has nothing to do with performance, it has to do with potential. You and I can separate who we are from what we do. And the one thing you learn with high self-esteem in life is you never carry failure forward. Failure is always left where it belongs as a learning experience, a stepping stone instead of a stumbling block, a temporary inconvenience. I've decided the one way you can spot a winner or loser in the making is 
the way you project yourself, your value. You always project on the outside how you feel on the inside. I know I do. I, I can't hide it. I'm not the best looking in the group, but I'm always looking my best in the group. I can't always wear the finest clothes, but they're clean and pressed usually. And you always project on the outside how you feel on the inside. You can't deny it or can't get away from it. And so that's, that's kind of the way it is. I can spot in me other people the ability to accept a compliment and the way you forecast your value to others. When people used to say nice things to me, I threw back all the value they gave me. It's an easy tip-off. Rejection of value or acceptance of value. Pretty nice looking suit, Dennis. And I'd say, yeah, yeah I was going to give it to the goodwill. You're right. <laughs> they said, uh, pretty nice tie. And I said, yeah, I got some mustard on it this afternoon. And I, he said, yeah, kind of sloppy eater. You're right. Uh, we brought you a present for your birthday. And I said, you shouldn't have. You spent too much. And they said, we know. Just checking your value. <laughs> they said, thank you very much for what you did for our son. And I said, it was nothing. They said, hmm. We'll tell him that for you. <laughs> we sure appreciate what you did the other day. And I said, don't mention it. And they didn't next time. <laughs> they knew. Why would anyone, when you're paid a compliment, not accept it? Gee, your hair looks beautiful, I said to her. And she said, <laughs> have split ends, need to go to the beauty parlor. <laughs> I said, because you got dark roots. She said, you got a big nose. I said, I knew that. <laughs> I wore this really neat sweater one winter, and they said, oh, look at that. What is it, uh, alpaca, or is it... Uh, I said, it's got a moth hole right here. And they said, oh, gee, better use mothballs. I'm learning to look at people now and hold their gaze. I'm learning to give them my hand and my name and that it's okay. I'm learning to project value to people. I'm learning never to lead with an excuse. I don't make excuses walking in. I try to give people value and accept it in return. Self-esteem, the single most important quality, the feeling that you got no ceiling. As you now know, self-esteem means accepting yourself as you are right now, as a changing, growing, imperfect, but valuable individual. And since self-esteem is the foundation for all high-performance human achievement and happiness, it's absolutely essential that you take specific action to feel better about yourself. Here are my action steps for enhancing self-esteem. First, take stock of your personal assets. Ask yourself, what are my talents and strong personality traits? Who are the family members and friends I can really count on? What are my accomplishments and skills? What are my goals? my dreams for the future. What do I want to learn? Where do I want to go? And who do I really want to be? Make a list of these important answers and review it often. Next, monitor your daily self-talk. Avoid using negative prison words and replace them with positive, constructive words. Instead of saying, I can't, say, I can. Replace, I have to, with I choose to, I'll try, with I will, if only, with next time, impossible, with possible, and why me, with try me. And finally, communicate value to others. Greet people with a smile and a handshake. Give your name up front when meeting someone in person or on the telephone and maintain good eye contact when speaking and listening to others. Always say thank you to compliments. The third winning attitude, in my opinion, is positive self-control. The idea that life is a do it with God, do it for others, do it to myself project. And I can take the credit of the blame for being just about who I've set out to be. I've never understood that until recently. I've never told a lie that hasn't come back to bite me harder than when I said this offhanded thing. It's the unfailing boomerang, the law of cause and effect. What goes around comes around, and it does. Responsibility. The healthiest, happiest, 
most directed human beings are the ones that believe that they exert a degree of control on the outcome of their lives by the choices that they make. Oh, there should be a statue of responsibility. Oh, there should be. It should stand tall on Alcatraz as a reminder of the rusted remnants of freedoms lost in the past. And that statue of responsibility should be standing high on Alcatraz in San Francisco Bay to match the Statue of Liberty. No freedom without responsible action. Life is a choice, and we make choices in the way we think. I need to understand that. I didn't know that. I thought I was just a victim of the system in my own way. My father was a warehouseman. My mother didn't know any different, and I thought I was destined to stay in the Navy. I could have. It might have been nice. I love the Navy. But I decided to get out, and what I've decided to do is study people who make choices. The healthiest people. Volition. I learned that the hard way, though. I learned it from one of my kids. Because I was a chauvinist pilot in the Navy. And if you haven't heard the story, it's true. And I'm embarrassed to admit it. My daughter Dana was nine months old in her high chair, and she didn't like Gerber's strained squash. She liked applesauce and Oreo cookies when they were split so you could lick the icing <laughs> before soup. And I was a chauvinistic pilot for the Navy, and I didn't take any of that stuff from a new recruit. I was flying in El Centro, California, in Navy jets, and I'll never forget that day. After a tough day at the office, blowing cows and chasing farmers on their tractors, spending taxpayers' money. I came back that day in my silver blue flight suit, which I wore to mow the lawn so the neighbors would know. <laughs> you wear your flight suit to mow the lawn, neighbors say, hey, I got one of them dudes next door. I drove a Porsche Targa looking for Honda Civics on the freeway. Little intimidation, fly formation on them. Well, get out of my way. Jet pilot coming. I had two 45 leather bullet belts crisscrossed across my chest. I'd seen an old Charles Bronson movie. I packed a 45 on my side in case they take me hostage. I shoot my way out. Had a hunting knife stuck in my flight boot. No problem at all. I go in the water. No problem. I cut the kelp, cut the great white coming in from the rear. Put my knife between my teeth and do a triathlon Iron Man into shore and stand there with my knife and my gun and my helmet with the bull of lightning which I wore in the car. <laughs> I walked in that day thinking it flows downhill in a pecking order. And what do I see? A nine-month-old tyrant in the high chair getting applesauce as a reward for doing nothing. I've had a tough day drinking Gatorade. I walked in and looked at my wife. She had squash in her hair. <laughs> squash on her face and on the tray and on her apron and none in the kid. So it looks like uh, you're being manipulated here. Best I take over. And I put my gun down on the counter, took off my bullet belts and put my helmet down. I said, what's going on? It looks like World War II all over here. And she said, she doesn't like squash. I'm giving her applesauce as nourishment. I said, give me that squash. She doesn't know what she doesn't like. She doesn't have taste buds. She's nine months old. She does what we say. I was raised during the post-depression. We were taught to clean our plate, which is why I'm chunky today. And I did what every good red-blooded chauvinistic pilot would do. I gave her the simulation training. I ate 11 bites of squash and showed her how delicious it was. I nearly gagged. I said, your dad likes it, so open up. It's the law. You love him, and he's eating it, and you can become a pilot if you eat it. Her gums clamped shut in defiance. The pupils in her eyeballs pinpointed, which meant I'd lost the sale. She said to herself quietly, go ahead, fatso, if you like it, you eat it. <laughs> My wife said, she gave me the same look. I said, yeah? Well, she can't get away with that look for me, because I won't tolerate it. I sent my wife out of the room. We got down to business. You'd be proud. As soon as my wife left, I took over, called power management for the... Yeah, I like to do that. As soon as my wife left, nobody was looking. It's a true story. She's nine months old. I squared off in front of her. You'd be proud. <laughs> her mouth flew open in surprise as I applied some pressure to the cheek area. 
said, you can't close your mouth, can you, honey? I shook her head. I said, you love your father? I raised it up and down. I said, how about some Gerber strain squire? Oh, you'd like some. Any more problem? Good. I stuffed it full of squash and held her mouth shut like every good father would do. I gave her the deal. Five bites of squash gets one bite of applesauce as a commission if the squash clears. Are there any questions? Nine months old, starting to make decisions, taking control. She decided to die by holding her breath rather than swallow. Her face turned red and purple. My face turned red and purple. And may I be stricken dead on the spot if I didn't say to my daughter, Go ahead and die. I've got other kids. Before you die, you'll swallow. And I held on. I don't take that from nobody. I glanced up at the kitchen clock. Fifteen seconds gone, no brain damage. Hang on. I stuck a mirror under her nose. There was no condensation. I squeezed it tight and got my nose to her nose, my eyeballs to her eyeball, and I gave her the last deal. It won't do you any good to do that, honey. You're going to have to breathe sooner or later, and when you do, down goes the squash. I'm holding on, and that's it. She looked at me and made a second decision at nine months old. The angle was right. He's close enough. She made a squash transfer. Oh, yeah, that's happened to you. It's happened to all of us. She exhaled suddenly. I squeezed tight and created the nozzle effect called linear acceleration. The squash went through this small orifice deep into my nasal pituitary area. And I went... and fell on the floor convulsing. I bellowed like a bull. My wife tiptoed back in and looked at me lying on the floor. And she said, <laughs> What happened, big guy? I said, Nothing. She doesn't like squash. Don't you make a big deal about it. And I've learned something about control. Children cry for a dry diaper and they cry for nourishment. They cry to be held. If whining gets goodies, the whining continues. People always do that, which they're paid attention for. I've learned something. Time is the only equal opportunity employer. Did you know that? You control the clock, how you use it, how you choose to spend your thoughts. You control your contacts, who you run with, who you model yourself after. You control that. You control your concepts, what you think about. You control your causes, what you've repeated over and over again to make your purpose. You control your communications, how you talk and what you say. You control your commitments, how much time you give to any one thing. You control your concerns, how you respond. Losers let it happen. Winners make it happen. Losers see thunderstorms. Winners see rainbows. Losers see icy streets. Winners put on their ice skates. Losers take chances. Winners make choices. It's all in the way you choose to think. And Earl Nightingale and the scriptures and people through the years have said it best. You do become what you think about most of the time. And most of the time you and I think about winning and success and positive opportunities. And we control that. It's the most exciting thing I've learned. I learned it from the Olympic athletes. Believe me, they have that moment, that moment to either choke or come through. And they control how they think just before they perform. And they always think in terms of the desired result. And they slow their heart rate down. And they get their breathing. And they say, come on, just like drill. Need a 10? Got a 10. This one's for you, Mother. Who does that sound like other than Mary Lou Retton? I need a 995. Need a 10? Got a 10. Control. Positive self-control means being in the driver's seat exercising your power of choice and understanding that losers let it happen while winners make it happen. So take control of your life. Here's a suggestion. Before going to sleep at night or first thing in the morning, make a list of priorities for the new day. Not just a list of things to do, but a lineup of key tasks with the most important ones at the top. Double check that list as the day wears on to see how you're doing. Take control of your time. List five important but unpleasant tasks that you've postponed and do them, all five, this week. Take control of your finances. 
Make a budget of your income and expenses and begin a regular savings program. Treat your savings account like a monthly bill and become accustomed to paying into it frequently. The next winning attitude is if you've got the control of the thought, where would you lead it? You lead it in terms of the imagined self. And the next point is a positive self-image, which in fact is no more than goals, because a goal is an image of the self, of yourself in it. And I look at that and I know what's happened to me. Your image of self comes mostly from the conversation that you have with yourself. You know, you and I talk to ourselves at four to six hundred words a minute every waking moment of our lives. What do you say when you talk to yourself? Hi, going to be another good day. It's going to be a great day for me. Another Blue Monday, another Friday. Thank goodness it's Friday. Thank goodness it's Monday. Thank goodness it's today. With my luck, I knew it would fail. I went down for the job, but there was a line around the corner. I can see it for you. I can't see it for me. I'm a good dancer. I can't remember names. I'm no good with figures. I'm a born Leo. It's the way we talk. Our imagined self is more based on self-talk than anything else. You are the Chief Justice of your Supreme Court. The most important conversation you'll ever have is the one you have of yourself, with yourself, and it leads to images and pictures and feelings and concepts which become goals when they're planted. Habits start like flimsy cobwebs, then with practice, like cables, we said. I have this little inner voice that goes around with me. I tell it what I'm thinking. I tell it what I see. I tell my little inner voice all my hopes and fears. It listens and remembers everything it hears. At first, my little inner voice followed my command. But after years of training, mine's gotten out of hand. It doesn't care what's right or wrong or what is false or true. No matter what I try now, it tells me what to do. You are me too, R2D2, are you me too? Continuous loop video cassette in my head of the kind of person I think I am, I say I am, I know I am. And you and I have one, like a tape recorder, there, recording everything we've been afraid of, everything we've thought of, everything we've done, and a lot of things that other people have told us that just aren't true, only their opinion. Fortunately for me, however, working with Olympic athletes and Super Bowl champions and winners, I got mine under control. And I know how to give my inner voice positive reinforcement. And when I talk to myself, I always talk with all due respect. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, you've got to be joking. I didn't think mine was going to be here tonight. Bring out the violins and the cheerleaders, folks. You should win a Tony Award, Waitley, yes. for Best Actor in a Live Performance. That's Don't let him said. kid you, folks. I'm the real Dennis Waitley. Yeah. I'm that inner voice he talks to at 400 words a minute possible, every waking impossible. moment of his life. And believe me, something has got to be done soon, or I might become permanently frustrated and resign myself to mediocrity and soap operas as a way of life. Nobody invited For you. example, yesterday morning when he got on the bathroom scale to oh. check his weight, he looked at the digital readout and groaned to me, Ugh, Will one of you please get off? Oh, that's stupid. You call that winning self-talk? And he has a sign for me to read posted on his refrigerator door. You know what it says? Rhinos eat here. <laughs> and last week on the tennis court, when he hit the ball into the net, yeah. he yelled at me. That's it, you stupid klutz. Let's play hockey now. Well. So I got even with him. And I instructed his arm to hit the next serve return over the fence and into the fish pond. A home run. He's just like everybody else in life. That's right. As his inner voice, I know the true story. Deep down inside, he should be my greatest friend and supporter instead of my greatest enemy, complainer, and critic. I need a whole new script with positive messages recorded on my tape to really help him win for the rest of his life. Right, Dennis? Right, robot R2-D2. Nobody invited you. What does he always show up for? Just when I think everything's going right. Just because I yell at him some, one, once in a while. What would you say if you got one of those talking scales? You get on it and it doesn't, it goes, Ugh. Will one of you please get off? That's all I said. I put Rhino on the refrigerator to remind me not to eat there, but I do. 
He's recorded everything I've ever said to myself in words, pictures, and emotions. Do you know that people make their mind up about you and I based upon our opinion of ourselves? They have no time to check us out. They just listen to what we say. And of all the things we say, you and I need to say things in the direction of a very specific target. Of all the things I know, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. If you don't know where you're going, you'll end up someplace else. And you won't recognize it when you get there because you really didn't plan to be there in the first place. The people who are the most specific in life seem to get a goal because the mind is the most marvelous biocomputer ever created. I had the good fortune to have as a professor Dr. Viktor Frankl, who led the resistance movement at Auschwitz and Dachau during the years of World War II. And Dr. Frankl realized that the people who lived the longest, who made it through those horrible years, were the ones who had magnificent obsessions, who were stuck on a marvelous target. I studied the Korean War. It was the only war in which no American prisoner ever escaped from a minimum security camp. You see, they have a way of checking you out by asking you questions about your life. Hi, soldier, where are you from? Who's your favorite ball team? What are you going to do when you get back? How much money do you need? If you said enough money, someday I'll. Uh, I don't really know. I don't have a ball team. Uh, I just want to be happy. I just want peace. The mind says, piece of pie, piece of bread, piece of what? What will make you happy? What will make you successful? How much is enough? You need to take the generalities and give them specificity. They took the people with no goals and called them purposeless. They put them in minimum security, cub, minimum security camp country clubs, and they tried to reorient them in the library. The death rate went up. The disease rate was up in the minimum security camp with more food and comfort. In the maximum security camp, they put people like you and I, people who had deep beliefs, people who wanted to get home, people who were going for freedom, who knew how much money we need, what kind of goals we believe in. And they classified them as dangerous because they were leaders. People always follow someone who knows where they're going. And so it was that the maximum security camp was full of purposeful people who were beaten and starved. The death rate went down, the disease rate was down, and many of them escaped. They knew where they were going, and they got there. But those who were there for the duration just stayed, and many young people pulled the covers up over their head and gave up because they didn't have a target. We've always managed to get what our currently dominant thoughts are, and we've always moved into that. You see, you can't come away from an idea. You can only go toward the dominant thought. Through the years, I've learned how to set goals that are just out of reach, but not out of sight. I've learned how to stair-step them like the Olympic athletes. You see, they never try to win the gold. They only try to do a better split, a little faster this, a little more of this. They try just to be out of reach, but not out of sight. And they even take pocket computers and figure out what they need to do the next split in to get it. And when they get a goal, because it's close in, they get positive reinforcement for having hit it. When they miss a goal that's close in, they can get easy correction to the target. I used to set my goals. I want to be president of the world. I want to be like any actor or somebody. Just today, you can't do that. You take it a little bit at a time, just out of reach. And of all things to tell yourself, never tell yourself what you don't want to happen, what you don't want to be what you don't want to recur again. Never tell yourself how much weight you don't want to be. Never tell your children, clean up your room, you pigs. I used to. Clean up your room, you pigs. They went, oh, oh, oh. I said, that's right, it's a pigsty, I want it clean. They cleaned it up and got it messy the next day. They know who they were. Oh, you can't come away from a condition. It's like saying, don't giggle in church. Why would you ever tell somebody not to giggle in church? Just because an apple fell off somebody's hat and rolled down the aisle, that's no reason to do that. Many of you who know about the World Series and sports know that sports is a microcosm of the world. And in sports, you see it all the time. A coach unwittingly telling a team what not to do in the second half. I remember in the World Series in the 50s, remember that day? 
Remember in the Milwaukee Braves New York Yankees game? Remember that? Remember Warren Spahn was the great left handed pitcher? Remember Elston Howard came up to the plate as the great Yankee power hitting catcher? Remember there were two on and two out in late innings? Remember what the manager, Fred Haney, and Billy Southworth, the pitching coach, said to the great pitcher? What would you tell your children? What would you tell your star salesperson? What would you tell yourself in a critical situation where you need to perform? They made the mistake of goal motivation. They walked out in the mound and said, you look a little tired, Warren. How do you feel? He said, I feel pretty good. They said, good. Whatever you do, don't give him a high outside pitch. He'll knock it out of the park. Put that one in your R2-D2, in your inner voice, in your little goaltender. High and outside, is that where we don't want to go? Yeah, that's where we don't want to go. That's why we told you that's where we don't want to go, to remind you of where not to go. Little R2-D2 said, I kind of like high and outside now. I wasn't going to go there. I was going to go low and inside, but I'll go high and out, just like you said. You see, the mind can't dwell on the reverse of an idea. The next ball was high and outside, a three-run homer. Around the bases they went. Warren Spahn threw his glove down on the dirt. Eddie Matthews came in and won the World Series for the Braves. And to this day, it rings loudly in my ear. Why would anyone motivate anyone on the reverse of an idea? Why would you ever tell yourself anything except where you wanted to go and be? I weigh this much. I'm fit and trim. I can feel my body grow stronger now. I'm achieving my financial goals. Not what I don't want to be, but what I want to be. The dominant thought of the winner. You know, sometimes that inner voice just isn't very cooperative. So you need to work hard every day to fine-tune it to feed it fresh information for building a new and better self-image. To be a winner in life, you must have a well-developed game plan. Your objectives can range from lifetime goals to daily priorities. Review what you want to accomplish in the next 12 months for your career, your family, finances, your education, public service, and mental and physical health. Set one major goal for each of these areas and review them often. And when you're not actively pursuing your goals, visualize your achievement. For 10 minutes every day, picture yourself already enjoying one of your goals. Imagine how it looks and feels and savor those good feelings. Next, learn new skills. Find a coach or mentor who can teach you the skills you need to reach your objectives. And finally, get constructive feedback. Share your goals with others and monitor your progress with feedback from a positive support group, not necessarily from family or friends, but from those genuinely interested in your success. The last ring is probably one of the most exciting of all. It's the single most identifiable trait in a winning human being. Identifiable because you can smell it, taste it, feel it, see it before it arrives. It's called positive self-expectancy. The self-fulfilling prophecy. You won't necessarily get what you want in life, but in the long run, you'll get what you expect. That's because Sikhi or Fishi the mind controls Soma the body. What the mind harbors the body manifests. It's mind over muscle, mind over menu, mind over money, and the mind that matters. When the mind talks, the body listens and acts accordingly. I can back that up more than I ever have in my life. Years ago, I used to study psychosomatic medicine, and I met Dr. Herbert Benson from Harvard, one of the great psychosomatic medicine people in the world at Harvard. He studied people in New Guinea, who practiced a belief system called voodoo. Voodoo is called pessimism. It's negative belief. Voodoo is what people believe in who expect the worst to happen, and it usually does. It's the pin in the doll. It's the expectation of illness. It's the expectation of the worst, and it has a powerful physiological effect on our body and our lives. He actually told of a story where the witch doctor played spin the bone. Remember when we used to play spin the bottle and got a kiss? When you spin the bone, the bone points at the native. And the native looks at the bone and says, Oh my gosh, in our tribe, that's it. And the native is out of life and out because of belief. If that's the extreme negative, what about the extreme positive? Why is it that luck is laboring under correct knowledge 
and fear is false education appearing real. If you don't know something about it, you're afraid. If you're lucky, it's because you're laboring under correct knowledge. If you find a role model and you practice and get it right and you begin to prepare and expect, you get optimism, which is the opposite of voodoo. Optimism is the natural high caused by people who are prepared to win by who they model themselves after, what they study, and the persistence they put to that preparation. I get so excited I can hardly stand it. They took blood samples of actors and actresses back in New York, and they found the people who were positive and optimistic in the parts they played had more endorphins, morphine within the blood, the natural high, 98 to 200 times stronger than anything you could take from the outside. No wonder. Endorphine, morphine within, natural morphine is caused by people with high expectations. Opiates are taken by people with low expectations. And because they're not optimistic about their future, because they don't have high self-esteem, because they feel out of control, their awareness tells them they need to be like everybody else. Their esteem tells them they're not worth much. Their control tells them they're out of control. Their image tells them that they have no goals. And their expectancy tells them that the only way to get happy is to get a dose, a fix. The people with low self-esteem and low expectancy take opiates from the outside. The only side effects are devastating. Winners in life with high expectations expect to win and do what's necessary. And they get endorphine. Women get it during labor to help along a blessed event. Athletes get it wearing their Sony Walkman listening to Chariots of Fire. I thought it was my Walkman that did it. It isn't. It's high expectation. It gives you the natural high. You know, that's exciting. You sing because you're happy, and you're happy because you sing. They both provoke the same idea of optimism. I'm optimistic about the future. I believe in the Chinese definition of crisis. In China, 5,000 years ago, they took the word crisis and made it into three symbols. Opportunity, riding the dangerous wind. Crisis has two edges, two sides, two faces. It's opportunity, riding the dangerous wind. Alexander Graham Bell had a family member who was hard of hearing, so he invented the telephone as a hearing aid, not knowing he was going to solve a communication crisis for the rest of the world. He was trying to help out his own family member as a hearing aid and invented the telephone. I thought inventions were invented by people who wanted to make money. They're not. They're invented by people like you and I who want to solve problems and who convert them into opportunities. When our house burned down, the flames were 70 feet high. Our house burned down and I drove in on that Sunday afternoon in La Jolla, California and I watched my house explode. We're right there on the hill. The ocean breeze comes through like a chimney, breaks out the windows, and it's gone. Beautiful wooden glass, just completed. As I drove in the cul-de-sac, I found myself saying, Why me? And then the voice came and said, Try me. I said, No, I don't want you to try me. I'd rather why me for a while. And I stood there, and I looked for the only thing I could, my family. And there they were, all standing there in the cul-de-sac with the dog and the cat and the two turtles, lightning and streak. They were all safe in the cul-de-sac, out of the fire. I must admit, I got optimistic. I said, ha ha, thank you. Whew. Safe again. Oh, fantastic. And I couldn't control myself. Uncontrollably, I began to, to giggle out of nervousness. <laughs> like that. And my kids saw me and they stopped crying and started giggling. I said, look somber, they'll think we started it. <laughs> Don't you go giggling like that. I was just being nervous. Oh, I'm so glad that, oh, I'm so glad you're safe and it's such a good fire. Oh, gosh, thank you, fireman, for coming. You're a little late. The news media was there first and the fireman got lost. It was on Hidden Valley Road. My banker was there in his bathrobe. He didn't know it was my house. He stood there watching with everyone else. He said, look at that fire, Dennis. And I said... Mm -hmm. He said, look at those windows pop out. And I said, mm -hmm. He said, look at that Mark IV blow up in the driveway. I said, it's a Mark V. <laughs> he said, oh, you high deficit, 
Oh, you world crisis. Oh, you difficult economy. Oh, you t oh, you loser. I said, no, 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 they're all standing outside. It's the best fire I ever had. I cleaned the garage and my tax returns were in there. I just got audited. Now I have amnesia. <laughs> he said, you probably did set it. And I said, no, but... He said, what about the pictures? I said, my parents have pictures we've never seen. He said, what about all the things? I said, I can get the things back. Peggy Lee sent me her album, the old torch singer, singer Peggy Lee. Is that all there is to a fire? It is if you got your children, your optimism, and your life. I'm so excited about positive self-expectancy because it leads and follows all the others. Because you usually get from life what you expect, it's critically important to expect the best for yourself. Let me suggest these action steps for positive self-expectancy. First, view problems as opportunities. Make a list of your most pressing problems, the ones that block your professional and personal fulfillment. Write a one-sentence description of each problem and then rewrite the description, only this time challenge your ingenuity by describing the problem as an opportunity. Next, maintain an upbeat outlook. Wake up each day to beautiful music instead of to a jarring alarm clock. Before doing anything else, take a brisk walk around the block to clear your mind for the day ahead, and then go eat a nutritionally balanced breakfast to fuel your energy. While showering or dressing, use positive self-talk. Tell yourself, it's another good day for me, or that sales meeting will work out just fine. Associate with winners. Avoid the naysayers. Remember, misery may love company, but so does success. And finally, expect the best from others. Praise and encouragement are powerful motivators. So offer praise and encouragement freely and generously to the others in your life so that they can rise to your expectations as well as to their own. If you're aware of the abundance that you've got, you get positive awareness. You open up to the potential. You start looking for opportunities. If you have good self-esteem, problems become a temporary inconvenience and a stepping stone comes out of a stumbling block. If you have a feeling of control, you believe that you control the way you respond to things and you and I respond to things effectively rather than reacting irrationally. If you have a good self-image, it's like a thermostat. You start controlling the way you talk and the way you think and the way you act. And you and I visualize. We visualize within while we're doing without. And if you've got positive self-expectancy, then you're a natural-born optimist. But it's just the way you are. And you see opportunities out of crises. You can be a total winner, even if you're a beginner. If you think you can, you can. If you think you can, you can. Raise that C up to an A. Make the big play, if you think you can. You can ride your own black stallion. You can wear the gold medallion if you think you can. It doesn't matter if you won before. It makes no difference what the halftime score. It's never over till the final gun, is there one? So keep on trying, and you'll find you've won. You can make your presence greater than the bear's refrigerator. If you think you can, you can. If you think you can, you can. You can profit through inflation and redirect this nation if you think you can. You grab a dream and then believe it. Go out and work. You'll achieve it. If you think you can, you can. If you think you can, you can. And we thought we could. And we knew we could. And we knew there was no time to lose. But we knew there was plenty of time to win. Thank you very much.